going to talk about 2 Samuel chapter 5 through chapter 12 today. And in that is talking about a story by the name of Nathan. Nathan was a prophet of God. And uh, he communicated to God. And, and there's a story all the way through 2 Samuel, a story of David. And uh, we may have heard the story of David, the king of Israel. And he conquered the Philistine army. And when he conquered the Philistine army, they came into Jerusalem. And they were excited, and he was the new king. And he had everything at his disposal. Early in his childhood, you remember the story of David and Goliath, and how David conquered Goliath. And all of Israel lifted up David and said, David had killed his thousands and thousands and thousands. And the entire country lifted him up and exalted him to a point that he thought he could do no wrong. He thought he could do whatever he wanted. And he had an opportunity one day, and he's looking up on top of his roof, and he looked down, and he saw this beautiful woman by the name of Bathsheba. And he thought to himself that I would like to have Bathsheba. He was married, and he had concubines, but he had the opportunity to sin with Bathsheba, and he took that opportunity. And he sinned with Bathsheba, and Bathsheba became pregnant. And when she became pregnant, the story starts with Nathan. Nathan came up to David, and he said something to him. Now, you have to remember, at this time, David had the entire country at his disposal. Everybody revered him. They thought that he could do no wrong. And all David would have to do is say, Nathan, I'm going to put you to death. And Nathan would have been put to death, but Nathan had enough within him, enough security within him that he said, I'm going to do what God has told me to do, and I'm going to confront David. And at the start of the sermon, I want to say we all need to have somebody within our life like Nathan. We all may have our insecurities, and we all have our failures, and we need to have somebody that will stand up in the midst of our failures, in the midst of our insecurities, and will be able to love us enough to talk truth into our life. Many times, we hide our insecurities and our failures so we don't want anybody to know what we would do or what we need. But Nathan was stood up in the face of David's popularity, and he said something. And it's found in 1 Samuel, or 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 through 7. I'd like to read it, and then we want to talk about his security compared to what we have our insecurities, but how can we take our insecurities and have strength? And the Lord sent Nathan to David. Here's the key. The Lord sent Nathan to David. And he came to him, and he said to him, There were two men in one city, the rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, and the poor man had nothing except a one little ewe lamb, which he brought and nourished, and it grew up together, and him with his children. He ate his own food and drank from his own cup, and it lay in his own bosom, and it was as like a daughter to him. And the traveler came to the rich man, who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare for a, way, for a wayfaring man who had came to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared for the man who had come to him. So David's anger greatly aroused against him. And he said to Nathan, And the Lord lives, the man who had done such as surely will die. And he shall restore fourfold to the land because he did this thing against who had no pity. Then Nathan said, David, you are the man. Get the picture. Nathan comes into the king, the king. And he tells him this story about a, a, a guy that had everything, a rich man. And he went into this poor man's house and he took his little lamb. And he said, he said, he took this little lamb. He didn't want to take out of his abundance. He wanted to go into this poor man's house and take a little lamb and slaughter it to feed somebody. And David's anger, he's, how could you do that? How could you take something from somebody that had nothing? And Nathan had enough spirit within him and said, David, the king, you did it. You are the man. How could you do such a thing? And here's what David did. When he was confronted with his sin, he fell on his face before God, and he said, I'm sorry. I was wrong. Until David was confronted with his sin, he tried to hide it. He sent Bathsheba's husband into battle to be killed. 
He did everything he could do to hide his sin. But when God opened up that sin, when God allowed that sin to be exposed, he was broken enough, contrite enough, that he asked God to forgive him of his sin. There's a phrase, be sure your sins will find you out. It's not a, it, there's not a better parallel to with Nathan and David be sure your sins will find you out. There's nothing that you will do in secret that will not be yelled at the rooftops because God sees everything. And God wants us to be open with our sin enough that we can communicate to him so God will break our hearts. So how did Nathan have enough security to confront David? Today I want to do a little teaching style because I think this is so important because I know we all have issues within our life. We all need to have people around us that will help us to communicate, to help us to give us strength. We all have insecurities, but we all need to find somebody like a Nathan that will come into our lives, that will help us out in times of difficulty. When we are struggling, that we don't want to tell anybody about, Somebody that will love us enough that will communicate to us the truth, but yet still love us in the truth. So here's what we need to do. We need to find this Nathan. So I want to communicate to you a few points about Nathan's security and who Nathan was and then how we can deal with it. The first thing, Nathan had God's truth behind him. Nathan had God's truth behind him. It's not about the opinions of man. It's about what God wants and how God wants to communicate to us. So we need to find somebody that will communicate God's truth to us. Not about our opinions or what they think we ought to do or what they think we should do. It's what does God want with us. And when we find that person that has God's truth with us, that loves us because God has communicated them to come into our lives, they have God's truth. And Nathan had a relationship with David. Nathan had a relationship with David. It's somebody that we, it takes time to build relationships. It's not somebody that we can just go into somebody and say, I don't like what you're doing, or I don't think that's the right thing. It takes time to build that relationship, and it takes time to be able to communicate truth within somebody's life. We have to be open and transparent and vulnerable enough that we'll let somebody come into our life that wants to build that relationship that we can communicate with. And Nathan's identity depended upon his divine call, not his popularity. Because he stood up in the face of a very popular king, but he knew that God's calling upon his life was more important than his popularity. And sometimes when we stand up for the truth, and sometimes when we communicate what God wants within our life, we may not be popular, but what we have to do is we have to do the right thing. To, conf to confront and to communicate God's truth may not be the easiest thing, but it may be the right thing. And Nathan understood his personal mission. Nathan understood his personal mission. He knew that God told him to do something. And there's times within our life that we feel in our spirit that I should communicate the truth to somebody or I should help somebody out. What we have to understand is if God communicates that to us, our job is to help out a brother or a sister in Christ that may be failing, that may be hurting. But sometimes we look at that and say, you know what, I really want them to like me. I don't want them to hurt me, and I don't want them to, to throw me aside. And we have to understand that God has a mission within our life. And if we are God's Nathan for people, or we need God to bring a Nathan within our life, it takes a mission. It, we, we must do it on purpose. And Nathan was humble and broken. See, I think that's a major issue. Before we can be a Nathan, and before we can allow people to come into our life, it's not about our arrogance it's about our brokenness. It's about not saying, I'm right and you're wrong. It's saying, this is what God asked me to do. And when we walk into somebody's life, or when somebody walks into our life and we are hurting, and they come in with a humbled heart, and they say, you know what? I've been praying for you. I've been, I've been watching something within your life. And I feel like there's an issue that I need to talk to you about, or I want to give you the opportunity to minister to me about. It comes in with a brokenness, and if we walk into an opportunity with a broken spirit and a humbled heart, usually that allows that brokenness to come back in and we can communicate the truth with a broken heart. You know, when Nathan comes into David's life, David had the popularity, but yet he lived in his sin. 
He knew what he had done. And I believe when we do things and we hide certain things and we have issues within our life, we try to put the mask on. We try to hide what we have done. And in that, although people may think we are one thing, but inwardly we are something else. That is what causes our insecurities. That's what causes our failures. We may want everybody to see something. It's called a mask or hypocrisy. It's just a mask living a lie. Sometimes our hypocrisy is within our life. And sometimes we put on that mask. Sometimes our insecurities is maybe that we have lived a life or somebody have told us certain things and we start believing those lies. So insecurities come from either sin or they come in from misinformation. So in our insecurities, what do we do? And how do we change our insecurities? We all need a Nathan, but how do we deal with our insecurities? The first thing that we do in our insecurities is we, we compare. We, we have comparisons. Now, we compare ourselves with others, and we keep score by others instead of what God wants for us. So by, in comparison, we, in our insecurities, we judge ourselves by what others think of us. And we don't get our identity on what God thinks of us. And if we judge each other, we're always going to find somebody that's better. We're always going to find somebody that can do something better. Or we always judge down and say, well, I am, at least I'm better than this person. We never judge up. We always judge down. So by comparison. And then compensation. We want payback. We want payback. If somebody did something to me or I'm insecure, I want to pay back. I want to cause problems. I want to cause pain. So compensation, we want payback. And sometimes in our insecurities, we fight in our insecurities and we cause problems. And then competition. Competition. In our insecurities, we compete with each other. We become self-consumed and try to outdo others for attention. And you can tell when we are insecure because sometimes we overdo in our insecurities. We overcompensate in our insecurities. And if we overcompensate in our insecurities, what we do is we just compete and we try to hurt others and we try to be better than other people. And then compulsions. We feel driven to perform in order to gain others' approval. Self-centeredness, compulsion. We want to outperform. We want to do something to be judged. Others can judge us and say that we are better at something else. And then condemnation. We judge others or ourselves resulting in self-pity or conceit. We either go into, into the pits and we, we get down and we get depressed, we get out, or we get conceited because somebody thinks we're better. Either we go down or we go up in our arrogance. So what we have to do is we cannot condemn ourselves, but neither can we praise ourselves. But yet sometimes we just like to control in our insecurities, causing control, being in charge of everything. So we are in, so we are in control of every issue in our insecurities, we can't allow other people to take control because we have to be in control in those insecurities. But here's what I wanted to share with you today is how do we deal with our insecurities? I believe the most important part of our ministry, the most important part of our family, the most important part of our life is how do we deal with our insecurities? How do we change from our insecurities to allowing God to work within our life? I love the story when Nathan confronted David, what David did. He had sin within his life. He had the kingdom that he could rule over. He had everybody at his beck and command. But yet Nathan came into his life, and when Nathan came into his life and he confronted him, David changed from somebody that was caught in the middle of sin to somebody that had a broken heart, and he said something to God. If you have your Bibles, let's go to Psalms chapter 51 real quick. Psalms chapter 51 and verse 10, it says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast away from my presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressions your ways, and sinners shall not be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt and the bloodshed, O God, and the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness." This is, a, this is a prayer that David had after Nathan confronted him and he was broken into sin. 
David went to himself and he made this prayer, create in me a clean heart. There's no way that we will ever get out of our insecurities and our failures until we first create in me a clean heart. We have to get into our life and get into our hearts that we want God to do something big within our life. That we want God to break us to a point that God can be glorified and not us, but him change our hearts. David had everything at his disposal, but he knew that he could not change until he first fell on his face before God and said, God, I need you to blot out my transgressions. I need you to forgive me. Because only then can I live a pure heart and a pure life that I know you will establish your kingdom with. Now, as we watched in the movie The Bible, uh, we saw that in David's consequences of his sin, that there was all kinds of consequences from this act. And in those consequences in this act, it caused all kinds of pain within his life. But David realized that he himself had to deal with his own sin. And in his sin, there will be consequences, but God wanted to restore David and give him peace and create within a clean heart. So what are the four things that he does? The first thing is the identity. We have to know that God loves you and that God loves you enough that he wants you to stay in his will and not outside of his will. Stay in his will. How do we stay in his will? By putting people in our life that will communicate to us the truth of the word of God. Communicate to us an environment that's healthy. You know, we do all kinds of counseling. And one of the things in counseling that we talk about is creating an environment. Creating an atmosphere that when you go do certain things, you, you're, you're hanging with people that will do the right thing instead of get you out of your comfort zone or get you out of what God wants you to do. You, you hang in the environment that's going to keep you healthy. Understand your identity is in Christ, and what you must do is you must put yourself in the environment that you can stay in Christ and stay with his will and not put yourself in an environment that could cause you to stumble. The environment or your identity in Christ is very important. Your identity means I'm going to put the boundaries that I need to put within my life to make me stay where God wants me to stay. If I stumble out of the environment, if I start doing things outside of God's will, God's protection will fail. Because we're asking God to bless us to do something that God's will will not allow. So I use a simple illustration. It's the umbrella illustration. It, pouring down rain. Pouring down rain, and, and you put this umbrella up. You are safe from the water under the umbrella. And that is God's protection within our life. And sometimes what we do with God's protection is we open up the umbrella, and then we put the umbrella to the side. And we allow the world and all the issues of the life fall on our heads, and God's will is setting on the side of us. And we realize that we can be safe in God's will if we just move under the umbrella. But we do not want God's protection. We like what we have. We like doing everything in this world. And we say, all I need to do is move under God's protection. So God's will is given to us through the word of God, but sometimes we like our will and not God's will. But God cannot and he will not bless us outside of his will. So uh, if somebody would say, hey Bruce, will you pray for me? I want to do certain, I want to do this and that. Uh, but yet, whatever he wants to do is saying it's, it's not God's will. It's breaking God's word. And I, you know, I can't pray for you for God to bless you when you know God's word says you shouldn't do it. So I, I can't pray for something and ask God to bless you when it's outside of God's will. But if we ask God to bless us in his will, in his protection, we can have the environment that God will bless us in. So knowing it's God's word and God's will, God can bless us in it. So we have to be in his will, under his protection, and knowing what our identity is. And then the second thing is brokenness. Brokenness. This is, I believe, a key point before we will allow God to get us out of our insecurities or out of our failures, he first has to get to a point that we are broken. In other words, we have to get to a point that we understand that we are not doing what God wants us to do. Now, God does things in weird ways. 
His ways are not our ways, and our thoughts are not his thoughts. He does things that we would not understand. But what God always does, everything that he does, he does it in order to bring us back to him. We may have all had wayward children, or we may have things going on within our life, and we ask God to bless them, and we ask God to take care of them. But God will always do certain things to make them come to their own repentance. In Luke chapter 16, we talk about the prodigal son that went down to a far land. And the Bible says he came to himself. In other words, when he was broken enough, he understood that he was not doing what God wanted him to do. He came back to his father. There's always a point when our lives or our children's lives or our family's lives where they will always get to the point where when they get broken, when they come to their own repentance, when they understand what God wants, then they will come back to God. But sometimes we try to control, but they will never change. We will never change until we first get to the point that we need God. Until we know that we will not make it on our own, we will never make that pure change back to God's will. So God breaks us, changes us to a point that we desire Him. And when we get to the point that we desire Him, we are broken, we are humbled, and we realize, I can't do what I need to do without him, then that's when God's will starts working within our life. Brokenness. It's not a fun place to be, but it's the best place to be. We may not want to go back where we were, but what we realize, if I never were at that point, if I never got broken, if I've never been humbled to the point that I desire God's will, I would never have God's blessing. But we all have to get to the point that God will break us in order to have us where he needs us to be. And then after we're broken, we realize that there's a purpose. I've gone through all this stuff for a purpose. God has allowed me and has broken me for a purpose within my life. And when we know that there's a purpose, when we know that God has a will within our life, and we know that there's things that have taken place in my life for me to get to the point that I can minister to others. I can be the Nathan to other people. In other words, I can just be honest with them and I can get into their life and I can minister to them and love them and help them. I can be broken enough that I don't judge them. I love them. I can communicate the truth to them because I understood that I needed that forgiveness and I understood that I had been broken so I can get into other people's lives because I have a purpose. Discover the practice, your God-given purpose in life, not someone else's purpose, but your purpose. God has created within you a conduit, a vehicle, in order for you to be uniquely gifted, and your circumstances and your situations are uniquely gifted by God. I love that when God saves us, God changes us, but God leaves us who we are. We, we may change our destination, we may change what we do, but our personalities and who we truly are on the inside, it never changes. We, we are who we are. And God allows our uniqueness to make difference in other people's lives. What we have to do is we have to be willing to allow our purpose, what God has called you to do, to be a mandate within our life. Not to go through our Christian life just as a ebb and flow and let whatever happens, happens. But understand... I am uniquely gifted by God for a purpose. And that purpose is to bring glory to his name, whether it's in talking to somebody about their salvation or talking to somebody about their life, but get involved in other people's lives because of where you've gone, God can help you in ministering to other people. But we have to get out of our bubble. So as a healthy church, what is this all about? As a healthy church... In our security, we can help other people through their insecurities. In our insecurities, we can have other people that have gone through things to help us get out of our insecurities or out of our failings. But what we have to do is we have to engage in other people's lives. We have to look and be family. We have to look around and say, what is other people going through? What can I do to minister to that individual? And if we on purpose look for our mission 
and on purpose look at what other people are going through, what God does, he allows your failures and your brokenness and your success to allow other people to know, I can be inspired. I don't have to live in my heart an insecure, fake life. I see that there's success. I see that God worked in somebody else's life. You can talk about what you've gone through, and you can inspire other people to say, you know what, if you could do it, I can do it. Because when we look into a church, we look into our life, we come into a church on Sunday morning, and we see a bunch of people that everybody's dressed up, and everybody has a smile on their face, and everybody's put that facade on. And everybody acts like everything is great and wonderful. But if you could unzip that facade and get deep into their life, you would realize that each and every one of us are insecure, hurting, and struggling in certain areas of our life. But we don't want to admit that. We want everybody to think everything's great and lift us up and make everybody feel everything's wonderful. But deep within our soul, there's failures, there's insecurities, and there's pain. If we are going to be a healthy church, what we must be able to do is to get into other people's lives. We must shoulder up others, lift them up, be honest with them, but at the same time, love them. Don't judge them, but encourage them. Because they could get into your facade, they could unzip your life, and they can see your failures and your insecurities you may not have the same failures that they have or the same insecurities they have, but you have yours. But if we could encourage one another and love each other and help each other and understand there's a purpose for our church and there's a purpose for your life to get into other people and to love them and to help them and to encourage them and to get rid of their insecurities and their failures, to lift them up to God's will, then that's when joy takes place. Because you can, David had everything. He had everything at his disposal, but he didn't have inner joy. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 51 that David said, Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Restore. That means he didn't have it. He had everything that he wanted, but he didn't have inner peace. And we could look like we have everything, and financially we could have whatever we think we need, but there's one thing that every one of us truly desire, and that's inner peace. That's to be able to put your head on that pillow and go to sleep. That's to be able to love and to encourage one another. Inner joy, inner peace, to know that I have a purpose within my life. And then give and receive the blessing. Give and receive the blessing. In other words, allow people to know what you're going through. Find someone to share your life with. Find somebody outside of your family that you can minister to. Look at their life and give them what God has given to you. Give them what joy you have. How do you do that? By engaging their life, by getting into their areas that they struggle with, by being a friend. Nathan was the prophet of God, sent by God to confront David of his sin. And I believe when you look at Nathan's purpose, Nathan's purpose was to redeem, to get into David's life, to communicate to David that there's a problem. And I believe God has given to us certain purposes. And one of the purpose of our friendships, one of the purposes of our church is to give and receive blessings. Be a blessing. Be something that somebody needs. When somebody is hurting, when somebody is struggling, when somebody is a, a facade, but you know deep within their life that there's pain. It's not a pat on the back to say everything's great. It may be a hug. It may be a cup of coffee. It may be going to somebody's life. I had a, I had a friend that... Uh, um, He's been up at the hospital with his wife for the last few weeks. And uh, uh, she has stage four cancer. And uh, uh, he's, he's one of those guys that, you know, he, he never cries. He's always up and he's acting like everything's great. 
I called him up and I said, hey, let's, uh, let's go have lunch. So it was just him and I and uh, uh, an opportunity. And I, I just asked him some questions and started talking. And uh, in his heart, you could just see that he just was broken and scared. He didn't know what to do. He threw out all kinds of these worst case scenarios. What could take place? What is going to take place? And you could just see that as a pastor, he had all the answers for everybody else. He could talk to everybody about all their problems. But he was broken on the inside. He doesn't know what to do. His insecurities, his fears, he's just welling up inside of him. And I just had an opportunity to talk to him and to pray with him. Didn't change anything. But I just got to let him know that as a pastor, I can be your pastor. There's going to be times that I need you. There's going to be times that I may struggle and you may be able to come into my life and help me. But this time, you don't have to have the answers. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to have a smile on your face. You can, you, I told him, I said, you can cuss, you can drink, you can do whatever you want. Just talk to me about it. And he, just, he said, Bruce, thanks. I didn't and I don't know how to deal with my own issues. And sometimes we just need to be open and honest with somebody and just say, you can deal with it. Let me help you. We prayed. He got up and he went back to the hospital. That 45 minutes to an hour did me more good than probably him because I just got to let him know, I love you. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know how to deal with it. I just want to be your friend. And if all we are is somebody's friend, letting them talk, letting them share, letting them open up, God can use us in a great way. We have to be vulnerable, we have to be broken, and we have to allow God to bless others by willing to get into their life. It may be difficult, it may be awkward, but God can do great things through you. We, as a healthy church, must get out of our insecurities and our failures and get into people's lives and minister to them and love them and help them. We may not understand everything about them. If I can just get you to remember what I have to remember this one point is unzipping God's life, your life, and looking deep inside your soul. You have issues. I have issues. We all have problems. We can live a life of a facade for so long. But we all have those issues within our life that we need and we want somebody to come into. If we can look and we can see and the Holy Spirit has drawn us to each other and we know that there's problems and needs, our job is to help, love, and encourage. We may not be able to fix anything, but what we can do is we can know that God has a purpose within my life to get into somebody's life, to help them, to encourage them. You know, Nathan, uh, when he confronted David, he didn't care what Nathan, what David thought of him. He knew what God wanted him to do. And as long as we do what God wants us to do, the circumstances will be okay. When God sent Nathan to David, Nathan knew he was safe because God's will was going to be performed. And when we confront and when we love, we may have to get out of our comfort zone. We may have to do things that we don't necessarily want to do. But when we do what God wants, we're going to be safe in his hands. But our problem sometimes is we have to be vulnerable enough that if I confront somebody or I talk to somebody, they may see, well, you have your own issues. You have sin within your life. Or you have your own insecurities. So sometimes we don't want to communicate to somebody because we have to be transparent and open to them. And before we can communicate to somebody, we have to deal with our own lives. So as a Nathan, he had to deal with his own issues before he can confront David of his issue. So in order for us to be broken to minister to others, we have to first look at our own life. 
We have to look at my insecurities and my failures. And God will fix me and help me and heal me. But sometimes I don't want somebody to judge me. I don't want somebody to look at me and say, you don't have the right to speak within my life. And I share with this all the time on Sunday mornings. You know, I don't feel like I have the right to share the word of God with everybody because of my failures and my insecurities. And every Sunday morning, every Saturday night, I have to come in before you and I get on my knees and I say, God, forgive me of my failings. Forgive me where I fail. Lord, work within my life because I'm just like you. I have my own failures. I have my own insecurities. But all God asks us to do is what David did. Fall on his face before God and say, create in me a clean heart. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. And when we ask God to forgive us and to help us, we have the right because God has the will. And we can talk to others because we have first talked to God. So the challenge, in our insecurities, let's take our insecurities and put them at the altar of God and walk away with a true identity, a brokenness, a purpose to receive and give blessings to others. We do that through God's working within our life. Where is it? Where is it in your life? That God is saying to you, I need you to deal with this, this sin, this issue, or even this insecurity. I want you to deal with this because once you deal with this issue, I'm going to do great things within your life. I'm going to open up doors of opportunity that you can't even comprehend. But before you can be a Nathan, you have to be David. Before you can do what I need you to do, you have to deal with your own spirit, your own bitterness, or your own insecurities, or your own failures. But once you deal with that, I'm going to do great things within your life. Brokenness. Do you have a point within your life that you say, God, I'm yours. Everything about me, whatever I've done, my failings, even my insecurities, I want to give them to you. I think each and every one of us, when we unzip our life and allow God to look deep within our soul and to investigate where we are, we would all have areas in our life that we would just not be happy spiritually. We would not be happy with what we do or where we are. And God's saying, why don't we just give that to him? And if we give that to him, God will fix us, heal us, and help us. That's a major rainstorm, isn't it? All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. And Lord, I pray that where we have failed you, we will ask you to heal us, creating us a new heart, a clean heart, a helpful heart. And Lord, opportunities arise every day that we can be that Nathan, that we can help others in their failures, in their insecurities, and in their weaknesses. But allow us to walk through those doors humbly, with a broken spirit, understanding that you have forgiven us, and you have called us to do things that are unique, not judgmental, but with humility to talk to people and to help people, to encourage them along the way, to allow our lives to be integrated with people, to encourage them, to love them, to help them. We thank you for the illustration of a prophet by the name of Nathan that went to a king, and you are the man. But he did it with a humble heart because he was a friend that wanted the best for him. Give us that courage. Give us that ability to love, to help, and to minister to those around us. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Pastor Al.